Assalamu alaikum, Birmingham. It's a pleasure to be here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and bless you. Brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajba'in. You know, brothers and sisters, with the ongoing atrocities that we are seeing in Gaza and Palestine, our hearts bleed. We're seeing the atrocities on social media and we feel helpless. It's very hard to see it all the time and we don't know what we can do more than that. But we are trying our best. And one of the things that we are seeing is a phenomena, a change and a shift in the world. I think you'll agree with me. A change and a shift in the world where for the first time in 75 years of the history of Palestine, people around the world, Muslim and non-Muslim, in the billions, are seeing a very different narrative and the strategy in the future is going to be different. Insha'Allah, a new generation with new justice, insha'Allah ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is planning everything. At the same time, another new phenomena has showed up. I think you'll agree with me that so many people we've seen on social media are now either converting or reverting to Islam and they are looking at the Qur'an TikTok analytics show that there are over 30 billion views with the hashtag Islam and Quran now. Never seen before. All because they are inspired by the strong faith and the strength of our Ghazan brothers and sisters who are showing what reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really means and they're thinking to themselves, what is it about their faith and this Qur'an that makes them stand in, in the face of such atrocities while seeing their children being pulled out of the rubbles right before their eyes dead? What is it we want to know? And you know what, brothers and sisters? The sentiment is changing. For the first time since the beginning of the 21st century, contrasting the anti-sentiment against Islam, we, you and I, have to continue to be steadfast. And we have to attach ourselves to the Qur'an. The words of Allah never change. And alhamdulillah, they are still with us. Allah talks to us every day. Brothers and sisters, the theme of this event is called the Qur'an. The Qur'an. And we don't want to be among those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about in the story of one of the prophets who was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the other prophets when they said about when it, it talks about the day of judgment and the prophets will stand up and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa qala ar-rasul ya rabbi inna qawm ittakhadhu hadha al-qur'ana mahjura the messenger will say on the day of judgment oh my lord my people these ones they abandoned the qur'an and didn't live with it in their life he'll complain we don't want to be among them we have to be proud with the qur'an and today, insha'Allah, I want to present a very short talk about a specific verse in the Qur'an which talks about three levels of believers. Three levels of believers. Let us look at those verses, insha'Allah. In Surah 35, verse 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَضْلُ الْكَبِيرُ جنات عدن يدخلونها يحلون فيها من أساور من ذهب من ذهب
ذهب ولؤلؤا ولباسهم فيها حرير وقالوا الحمد لله الذي أذهب عنا الحزن إن ربنا لغفور شكور Allah says, Then we bequeathed, meaning we gave over like an inheritance, the book, the Quran, to those of our servants that we chose. Now, some of them wrong themselves, and some follow the medium course, and some by Allah's leave compete with each other in acts of goodness. That is the great bounty. They shall enter the everlasting gardens, shall be adorned with bracelets of gold and with pearls and their apparel. Therein shall be silk. They will say, all praise be to Allah who has taken away all our sorrows from us. Surely our Lord is most forgiving, most appreciative. Let's analyze these verses. It starts with Allah saying, and so we bequeathed the Qur'an to those whom we chose. Who does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose to hold the Qur'an? Every Muslim. The Muslims are the inheritors of the Qur'an. Who are the Muslims? They are two types. They are the ones who were born into a Muslim family. And as they grew up, they maintained being Muslims and they kept it going. They are the first inheritors of the Qur'an and the second inheritors of the Qur'an are the ones who were not born into a Muslim family and they were non-Muslim. Then they studied the Qur'an and they believed in the Qur'an and said the Shahada and died upon it. These are the two people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about who inherit the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So rejoice brothers and sisters that you are all heirs of the Qur'an whom Allah chose. You might be thinking, how does Allah choose me? Do I have no choice? Yes, you do. The hidayah of Allah, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you, is coupled with you wanting it. It's like a person who is lost and trying to find their way in a land which they've never been in. So they find someone who is a local and they give them a map. If you follow this map, you will reach the destination. If you don't follow this map, you will be gone astray. But if you do follow the map and you reach the destination, then we say, who is the one that helped you be guided? The person who gave you the map. Who is the one that reciprocated and responded to it? You. So that means you chose the map and the map chose you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the guidance. You reciprocated. Therefore, through Allah's guidance, you have been chosen. Brothers and sisters, being the heirs of the Qur'an, however, there are three types of these believers. The first type of the believers, level number one, those who are unjust to themselves. The level two, those who choose the medium course. And number three, those who excel and race towards goodness. These are the two levels of believers, no fourth. All of them are inheritors of the Qur'an and all of them are promised paradise, insha'Allah. And all of them will finally say, Alhamdulillah who has given us this and taken away our sorrows. And Allah says, finally, your Lord is forgiving, most appreciative. Forgiving means Allah will not look at the tiny little details of your sins. He'll forgive your sins without you even asking. Allah is not like a person who looks at every single mistake that their employee does, for example, or their child does, or their student does, or whoever, and then punishes them for every little thing. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. And He looks past a lot of our sins, and He is appreciative, meaning that for the little work that you and I do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you tremendous rewards in the thousands and multiples over each other. Brothers and sisters, let's look at the three levels. Level number one. Those who wrong themselves, those who are unjust to themselves. And this is the majority of Muslims in the world. Who are they? 
the ones who wrong themselves or the ones who are unjust to themselves. They are Muslims who sincerely believe in Allah and the Quran and His Messenger. If you ask them, they say, I believe in Allah and everything Allah brought in the Quran. I believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, everything he said. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. However, they wrong themselves. They live a life filled with sins. They live a life with major sins, on and off. They repent sometimes, but they procrastinate a lot. They don't fulfill all their obligations, all the fard. They pray on and they pray off. When they fast Ramadan, they do it kind of with annoyance, for example. And sometimes they might miss a day or two. They are people who have neglected the obligations, done a few major sins, and they live a life of sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they are unjust to themselves. But they believe, but sinful. Culprits, but not rebellious. Weak of faith, but not hypocritical and unbelieving in their hearts. These people are called ظالمون لأنفسهم Those who are wronging themselves. Subhanallah, how beautiful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states it. Allah is not the one who wrongs us. وَمَا ظَلَمْنَاهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ Allah says, we are not the ones who wrong them, but they are the ones who wrong themselves. We choose to wrong ourselves. Why should we wrong ourselves? Why should we hurt ourselves? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want that. But He doesn't make a person become religious. It is good to say, Oh Allah, ihdini. Oh Allah, give me guidance. It's good to ask someone who is going to Umrah, say, make dua for me for Allah to guide me. It's good. We always ask Allah's guidance. But if you think that guidance comes without your efforts, just by dua, then the shaitan has played and manipulated your mind. Dua with your work. Allah doesn't change you. You have to change yourself. This first group, brothers and sisters, they are, what is their fate? Their fate is that if they die like that, they will be judged. And on the day of judgment, their judgment will be back and forth. Meaning that they will argue about their sins. There'll be a discussion. Why did you do this? What explanation have you got? And this person who has wronged themselves will say, but my Lord, you know, so-and-so, it was their fault. It was my parents. It was my friends. It was my shaitan. It was my... They keep going back and forth. And some of them deny. These people are Muslims. But they will be scared on that day, so there will be a bit of a discussion happening. Also, their fate will be the following. They will be detained throughout the day of judgment. Allahu a'lam how long that will be. But after a long time, they will either suffer some punishment on the day of judgment, or they'll just be waiting and don't know their fate. And some of them will go to hellfire for a little bit, but eventually saved. And some of them won't go to hellfire at all and eventually saved. And some of them will be waiting, not knowing what their fate is. But then finally, Allah's mercy reaches them and they enter paradise. Aisha radiallahu anha, when she heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Man whoever on the day of judgment is judged is most likely going to be punished. She said, Ya Rasulullah, what about the verse in the Quran which says, What does it mean, Ya Rasulullah? And she said to him, Fidaka, Ya Rasulullah. I would ransom myself for you, O Messenger of Allah. This is his wife saying that to him. And out of respect for Rasulullah, what about the verse that says, and those who receive their book in their right will be judged an easy and light judgment. He said, Ya Aisha, those are the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will just show their sins in front of them, but no discussion back and forth will happen. As for those where a discussion back and forth will happen, most of them will receive a consequence because they're going to be deniers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us among them. Among them are Muslims and sincere, but they wrong themselves. These types of people, brothers and sisters, I want to advise. 
There are people among us who look at themselves as religious. They're the best. Because they go to the masjid, they pray their prayers, they join charity organizations, they work in amazing events, they give da'wah, they wear hijab, they've got beards, mashallah, they dress in a certain way. There are people who are like that. And it's amazing. But unfortunately, some of us, the shaitan gets to us and makes us think that we are superior and better than everyone else because we've prayed a little bit more than them, for example. No. A true believer who is practicing never praises himself or herself and never thinks they are more pious than others no matter what they see in other people. Allah says, فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ he is the one who knows truly Never who praise is pious. yourselves in However, piety. They have a duty. Never look at people who are sinners as inferior, but look at them as people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe has put in your lives to help them, teach them, guide them, and treat them with goodness. We do not put down people. We don't ridicule people for their shortcomings in Islam. That's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deal with, not you and me. I see some practicing Muslims on the outside among my friends and among the people that I know sometimes fall into this problem. Instead of bringing people closer, they make them hate Islam. They make them run away from Islam because they're quick to play a kind of judge. And some of them may even fall into the problem of shirk. I'll give you an example. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there were these two men. One of them was on the outside more religious than the other one, so he kept on giving him advice. And his friend would not listen. In the end, the first friend was harsh to him, and then he said to him, Wallahi, Allah will never forgive you. You don't deserve it. Look at you. You don't deserve Allah's forgiveness the way you're going. Five years I've been telling you, six years or whatever it was. Rasul Sallallahu says, Allah will raise them on the day of judgment and he will say, Where is this person who is making himself a judger on my behalf? Who told you that I will not forgive him? I have forgiven his friend and take his other one to the fire. Why? Because the one who made the judgment played God. We have to be very careful of that, brothers and sisters. So, Rasul Sallallahu said, Bashiru wala tunafiru, yassiru wala tu'assiru. A believer gives good news and brings positivity and glad tidings to people. Even if they speak about something negative, they bring it in a positive way. Yassiru wala tu'assiru. Make things easy, don't make them difficult. Rasul Sallallahu told us, command good and prohibit evil. Command good with goodness and wisdom. Prohibit evil without the evil. Otherwise, avoid it if you know it's going to get worse. Our character is the best da'wah for most people. And people love to see a person walk the talk. Next, my dear brothers and sisters, is the level of the medium course. Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدْ Some of these who inherit the Qur'an among the Muslims are on the middle ground in their life. Who are they? They are the Muslims who do all the minimum Islamic obligations, all the fard, the five daily prayers, fasting Ramadan, their hajj, their zakat, they never miss it, and they don't do major sins. And if they do a major sin, they repent somewhat quickly and sometimes procrastinate. But at the same time, they neglect or they take the minor sins for granted. They say, ah, they're just minor sins, it doesn't matter. And you'll find them, they will do the makruh things, the disliked things. They'll say, ah, oh, it's just disliked, who cares? Ah, oh, it's just a sunnah. These people are the middle ground. They do fear Allah, they do the obligation, but they do the minimum, and they never go below the obligation. Sometimes they do nafil, sometimes they do sunnahs, sometimes they read the Qur'an, and sometimes they don't. And they've got long, sometimes they have long, you know, weeks on a high. 
and some weeks on a low, some weeks they, they free themselves and do sins and sometimes they get stronger. Sometimes they're only very strong in Ramadan and after Ramadan they go back to the bare minimum. Sometimes these are types of people the shaitan says to them, you did, uh, you did amazing in Ramadan and you've got all these good deeds, you can let your hair down for a, a couple of days on Eid and do a couple of sins. Man, they're not going to affect you because you've got big bags of good rewards. They're just going to be a drop in the ocean for you. And so they find excuses for themselves. These types of people are the middle ground. The first ones I mentioned are the majority. The fate. What is the fate of the middle ground people? They are the ones who on a day of judgment will have a light accountability. Because they repented from their major sins, they, had, they still did their obligations, they didn't fall beyond their obligations, and they didn't do major sins. The light hisab means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show them their sins and there will not be a discussion between them. And Allah looks at their good deeds as a whole and He looks at their bad deeds as a whole. Meaning He won't look at every single good deed and reward you for every single good deed and won't look at every single sin and reward you for every single sin, but as a whole. It's like when you go to the market and you want to buy tomatoes and you say, how much for the whole box? instead of every tomato. An example. Bad example, but it's an example. So that's the middle ground. And now we come to the last one. The ones who excel. The ones who excel are the ones whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the most. And they're the ones we need to reach. And they're the minority. Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ And some of them who inherit the Qur'an, they race each other for goodness. They race each other. They are fast, they compete for their hereafter. They see a good deed, you find them racing. They won't let him or her do it, they want to do it. They want to help, they want to donate, they want to be there before them. They want to go for the cause, they want to advise, but advise of course with goodness. They're the ones who want to pray, they want to be in the first row, they want to be to compete. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ It is in this that those who want to compete should be competing for Jannah. These are the people who love each other for the sake of Allah. These are the people who never abandon or hate each other for the sake of Allah. These are the meaning that for worldly reasons, they don't abandon each other. It's very hard to get them upset. And if they do get upset, they'll get upset from one angle, but they'll still love you from another. Ya yeah, akhi, my brothers and sisters, these types of people that we are talking about, they are unique. And there's not many of them. Wallahi, you see them sometimes. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with these types of believers, say alhamdulillah, night and day. Let's describe them very quickly. They have a different heart. They truly find love in worship. When they worship and when they pray, they love it. They like to stay longer. After their salat, they love to do their sunnahs. If they're too busy, they'll do it later. They sit after salat a little bit because they want the angels to make dua for them. They turn and they are ready to help and never make other people feel uncomfortable or feel that they're not wanted. The moment you sit with them, you feel like you are the most important person in the world because they are humble and they live below their reality. They're not people of ego trying to show something that they're not. They are humble because they know the Prophet ﷺ said, Man Whoever humbles themselves for the sake of Allah, Allah will lift them. They are the believers who what? They are the believers who on the day of judgment will be in the front row near to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them for their forefrontedness in this world by being forefront in the hereafter. Rasul said this in the hadith which is in Ibn Majah and Sunan Ahmad about these three levels of believers and how they'll be treated. A true believer is always repentant. As soon as they do a sin, they don't wait till the next day. They don't procrastinate. He is frequent in dhikr, this true believer. What does dhikr mean? Meaning they remember Allah not only in here but on their tongues and in their actions. Before sunrise and after sunset, he repeats the words, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al-Azim, 100 times because he read about the Prophet who said, 
who would like to make dhikr 1,000 times by saying these at sunrise and at sunset 100 times, Allah will count it for you 1,000. True believers, they make 500 tasbih, takbir, and tahleel. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, every day. How? After every salat. Five daily prayers. After the salat, they say subhanallah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 33 times, and finish it with la ilaha illallah. Count them all, and that's 500 times each. They make 500 words of dhikr every day. These people, brothers and sisters, they are strange and different to the common person. When someone interacts with this believer, that person always receives benefit. Whenever you meet them, you either walk away with new knowledge, with a new character, with a new feeling that is good, or you learn something from them. You always benefit from them in some way or another. The Prophet wasallam said, do you know who the true mu'min is? They said, Allahu wa rasooluhu no. He said, the true mu'min man amina nasu min lisanihi wa yadi. A true believer, uh, sorry, al mu'minu man aminahu nasu ala amwalihim wa anfusihim. A true mu'min is the one that when people are around him or her, they feel that their property, their blood, and their honor is safe. You don't get afraid of him. You feel that you can trust him. That's what a believer makes you feel. A Muslim or a believer covers the faults of his brother or sister. They don't go out of their way to expose their faults. They don't like gossiping or talking about them even if it's true and if there is anything that they need to talk to them about they think over and over again with sensitivity what is the best way that i can help this brother and sister from their erring should i do it in public on social media should i cancel them should i get up and make myself be known because you know in arabic we have this statement the scholars used to say khalif tu'raf if you want to be known, just oppose someone famous. No, a believer does not want fame. A believer does not want attention. And to correct his brother or sister, they will find the way that best helps them. Listen to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Rabi'ah radiallahu anhuma. Rabi'ah and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave them each a gift, a little land. And in the middle there was a palm tree. And the palm tree was in the way. And then Abu Bakr and Rabi'ah, they kind of disputed in a friendly way that the palm tree belongs to my land. And Abu Bakr said, the palm tree belongs to my land. The Prophet gave it to me. Suddenly Abu Bakr anhu said a word, Rabi'ah says, it hurt me a little bit. So then he realized and Abu Bakr anhu said, please say it back to me. Please say it back to me. He said, no, Wallahi, I will not say it back to you. So Abu Bakr said, I'm going to complain to the Prophet about you. So he went over there and some of the people who had converted to Islam knew they said, how can he complain when he's the one who hurt you with the word? He said, don't you dare talk about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He is the friend of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if he's angry with me, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may be angry with me and Allah will be angry with me. Get away. So he followed him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, is it true, ya Rabi'ah, what Abu Bakr is saying? He said, yes, ya Rasulullah. He said this to me and I wouldn't reply it back to him. He said, good, don't say it. But instead say, غفر الله لك يا أبا بكر. غفر الله لك يا أبا بكر. May Allah forgive you, ya Abu Bakr. May Allah forgive you, ya Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu then got up and walked away while he was crying and weeping. Allah forgive me. This is how the brotherhood and sisterhood is, brothers and sisters. We want the best for each other and we'll give up what we need for our brothers and sisters. Their reputation, their property, their wealth, their dignity, everything. And lastly, brothers and sisters, there's so much to say about what a believer is. But very importantly, we monitor our tongue, our ears, our hearts and our eyes. A true believer keeps them all protected and repents when they do the wrong. Brothers and sisters, finally, a true believer is someone whose family, his wife, his husband, his children, his parents, they all testify to their goodness. A believing husband treats his wife with goodness and respect and values her. He sees her as a gem, especially in public, he never puts her down. And if he ever advises her, it's in private. He makes her feel that she is secure and loved. He doesn't ridicule her with words. He doesn't ridicule his children with words so that they're afraid of their father every time he enters. A true believing woman is the one who makes her husband feel that truly he is a, an amazing man who provides his family, even if she sees some faults in him. And every now and then she tells him what she appreciates about him. Sisters, wallahi, if you want to help your husband, 
to be, um, feel amazing and to be more energetic and better in his life, your words will make a huge difference to his heart. Tell him what you appreciate about him. Brothers, you want your wife to love you and to treat you the way you would love, then you treat her in the way that she wants to feel secure and loved. That's how the Prophet ﷺ was. She said, Aisha radiallahu anha used to help us at home. He used to speak to us beautiful words and whenever he entered the home, he was delightful and cheerful. Even though people wanted to assassinate him and all the problems outside, Rasulullah ﷺ entered his house, basaman, cheerful. And when the children see you, they imitate you because our children don't often obey us, but they always imitate us. They'll say, how is mum and dad treating each other? This is the way I should be. That's how believers should be. So if the child sees his father ridiculing and abusing his mother, he'll grow up to abuse his wife. If a daughter sees her mother abusing her husband, she'll say, this is the way I've got to treat my husband because that's how my parents were. Yes, we are role models and Allah will ask us about that. On this note, brothers and sisters, I'm about to walk off the stage, but on this note, Speaking about marriage and speaking about relationships and building our families, subhanAllah, so many youngsters, they approach me and ask me questions about how do I prepare for marriage? How do I find a spouse? What are the red flags? What does Islam say? How do I go about it? How do I ask for a sister or, a, or how do I, for marriage? And sisters say, how do I approach a brother? What do I do? What do I expect? I see a lot of divorces happening. How can I avoid it? Please help us. For many years, I'm a marriage celebrant actually in Australia. And I help these people as much as I can. SubhanAllah, we've learned so many things along the way. So inshaAllah ta'ala for the first time, just like Mufti Menk and the others inshaAllah, I'm also holding a pre-marriage course once off inshaAllah ta'ala. For those of you who are interested, just go on the Instagram stories inshaAllah ta'ala. You can also sign up there inshaAllah ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, as Allah is my witness, I love to help my brothers and sisters as much as I can. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and to make you benefit for others for the best. Rasulullah said, the best of people is the one most beneficial to, to others. Finally, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our brothers and sisters in Palestine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, have mercy on their martyrs and make their children awaiting for them at the doors of paradise and in the fountain, at the fountain of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O oh Allah, change their fear into security and change their hardship into ease. O oh Allah, return the Muslims back to your deen. O oh Allah, unite the world to justice and assist us, help us, forgive us for our shortcomings. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.